Okay, Book of Acts. Where do we get the title from? That's a good look. That is a perfect look. She's looking at me like, huh? You're right. Nobody knows. It's probably not a creation of Luke's. It is more than likely something that was added in later on. You read through it, the Acts of the Apostles. And is it really the Acts of the Apostles? We have two in there that are covered predominantly, and then we have a few more that are inserted in there as well. But mostly it's Peter and Paul, right? And we see John in there, and we see James in there, and we see a few others, but just, just a little bit. What's the purpose of the book of Acts? Oh, that's an interesting question. Here, let me throw this one out. Uh, Irenicon, or Irencon. It's a fancy word that means peacemaker. See, Peter and Paul never got along, right? And their disciples never got along, so this helps to bring those two clans together, right? You better be shaking your heads like this. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. Peter and Paul never disagreed on doctrine. What did they disagree on? Well, they came to one disagreement, and Paul took exception with how Peter was, cha was um, treating Gentiles when he was around Jews. And Paul called him on it. And we remember from Paul's writings in more than one place, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus, right? I think that's in Colossians and Galatians and that or a, a slight deviation from it. All are one in Christ Jesus. Uh, so Peter, how come you're treating the Gentiles differently when you're around Jews? Shouldn't have happened. But that was the argument they had. That was it. Another idea, it's part two of Luke's history, the history of the church, and also how to become a Christian. That makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Awful lot of sense. We are told how we, how, what, 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 what do you need to do to become a Christian? Peter's first sermon, right? What did he, what, how did he finish up? You guys killed the Lord's son, Jesus, and they were cut to the heart. Brethren, what must we do? What's the obvious answer to that? What, what's the obvious question? What, do we, what must we do to what? Get right with God, right? What must we do to be saved from God's wrath? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness or remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it makes sense. A history of the church. Now, volume one was what? Life of Christ, right? Volume two is life after Christ. Life through the apostles. At least through most of the years of the apostles. Another possibility is a document um, that, uh, how come I don't have it in here? Some have, have put it that uh, Luke was writing this as a, uh, a briefing for Paul's trial in, uh, in Rome, preparation for Paul's trial in Rome. And while there might be something to that, why did he include the first 12 chapters before he gets to Paul? Okay, maybe an explanation of Christianity and how it began. But is... Volume 1, the Gospel of Luke, also part of that? How does this start out? You know, I wrote to you previously, Dear Theophilus, or something to that, that order. It's Volume 2 to Theophilus. And while it may help as a briefing for Paul's trial, should he actually have one, uh, I don't know that that's the purpose of the book. 
it can be used as one, but I'm not sure that's the purpose of the book. I still like it's a history or continued history of, of the church. And I like the idea that it's a, a way that we can find out how we become Christians. Questions? Gospel of Luke. Gospel, yeah, Gospel according to Luke is volume one. Yeah. Volume one, Luke's volume one, Luke's volume two. What, was there a Luke volume three? If there was, we'll never know. I know a lot of people would say, no. If there was supposed to be a Luke volume three, there would have been a Luke volume three. God would have made sure. But if we have everything we need and what we have, why would God make sure of a th volume three? If we don't need that extra information. Doesn't mean he wasn't working on it. Doesn't mean he wasn't planning it. We don't know. So, probably no volume three. But maybe. I like those. Just drop that little thought in your head and, and you can puzzle that for a while. Author. Luke. How do we know? Oh, I got you there, didn't I? How do we know? You know, there's no internal evidence for it. Yeah, but he doesn't sign that one either. No internal evidence. Right, but we, he didn't sign that one either. So, no signature on the first book, no signature on the second. So, how do we know? External evidence is the best help we have. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, around 190, says Luke wrote it. Tertullian, around 200, says that Luke wrote it. Eusebius, 325, says that Luke wrote it. Jerome, in 400, says that Luke wrote it. The passages, as we read through it, we, know, we see a bunch of we passages indicating that whoever it was was a close associate of Paul's. And Paul writes that, uh, uh, I've got it somewhere. I had it somewhere. What did I do with it? Paul wrote in another book that uh, Luke, the great physician, or you know, he doesn't call him the great physician, but he calls him a, a, a physician, uh, doctor, physician, physician, um, writes a, of him as a very close friend, associate. So uh, Luke fits the bill. And... Uh, I thought I put that in there. But there is no signature. Nothing to tell us for sure. He does not sign it. He doesn't say, we, uh, myself, Luke, and Paul. He doesn't say any of this. So we have to assume, and sometimes we have to turn tradi to tradition, and of course we have Clement and Tertullian and Eusebius and Jerome to tell us or help us understand that in the early days uh, after the, the Apostles were gone in, in the, the early centuries of the church. They all attribute this to Luke, so we will too. Questions? You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. Okay, maybe I am. Trustworthiness. Let's talk about a tax on trustworthiness. This is something we didn't talk about on that Wednesday night here a few weeks back. Uh... Paul's, Paul's conversation conversion account in um, chapter 9 verses 1 through 19 chapters 22 tw chapter 22 verses 6 through 16 chapter 26 verses 12 through 20 there are some differences there are some additions and deletions and some have a little bit and some have a little bit more and some have a little bit less and some have looked at that and say, well, you see, they don't match up. So obviously it wasn't written by um, Luke or it wasn't written by a close associate. It was written by somebody later on who's just either uh, putting down into words what people are teaching father to son, father to son. We all know that how that works out too, right? You know, if you whisper in somebody's ear and it goes around the room, and by the time you get to the last person, it's a totally different thing you whispered in the ear. Doesn't, not even close. We, we, everybody done that before? Yeah, I probably did in school. I know we, I did it in 
Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, and I did it in the Navy. It was, uh, it's an interesting um, exercise. And if that's the case, then you know by the time you get to the second or third century of passing it down through oral tradition, there's going to be some mistakes. Some things are not going to match. But that's not the case here. The, the men with Paul here in chapter 9, verse 7, or did they not hear according to chapter 22, verse 9? 9, 7 says they heard. 22, 9 says they didn't hear. We're going to have to open that one up and find out. All right, what do we got? 9 7. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice and seeing no one. So in 9 7, they heard. Right? And 22 9. Oh, not that far. Those who were with me beheld the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice. Ah, okay, well, never mind. That kind of explained it right there. In the King James or some older versions, in one it says they didn't hear, and the other it says they did hear. In this version it says one place it says they, did, they heard, and the other place says they didn't understand. And that's the answer to that question. If you have a version that says they heard in one didn't hear in the other. They heard in this word. They didn't understand in the second one. Okay. My NASB is correct. How did I miss that in my studies? Two different words are translated here. Uh, of course, one meaning to hear and the other one meaning to understand or not understand. So, did Paul see the Lord? 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Or did he not see the Lord? Acts 26, 13. Let's see if that works out. 26, 13. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. That was 26.13. Huh? Right. I'm, I'm talking about, well, did he see or did he not see the Lord? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.8. And last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Did he see him or did he see just a light? Or do we look at it and say, it's the same thing. The people who would say or argue against it would say, it's not the same thing. Well, I say it is. And I think a lot of other people are going to agree to that. How in the world do you say that the light wasn't Jesus? He spoke to him. Told him who he was, right? In either case did Paul mention seeing him physical form. The blinding light he saw in 9, he understood to be the representation of the Lord. And he actually told him it was him, so. Okay. Uh, alleged a silence in Acts about the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. We know that Paul collected money for Jerusalem, right? It was a famine in Jerusalem. He collected money and he was taking it there along with some other people. When reporting on the third missionary journey, nothing is said about the collection made for the saints in Jerusalem. So what? Does it mean that it wasn't taken? An argument from silence. 
It was noted, however, that there were several men who traveled with Paul in Acts 20, verse 4. The purpose of their being there is found in 1 Corinthians 16, 3. They were sent by the church to bring an offering. Additionally, Acts 24, 17 does mention Paul bringing alms and offerings. Finally, an argument from silence is usually a poor argument. It doesn't mention it when he's making the report. So what? Luke may have included, not included it, or may not have included uh, the alms or the, the offerings because it wasn't within the scope of what he was writing, the scope of the purpose for the book. It didn't matter. It doesn't mean that they weren't taken. It doesn't mean that it, it, it contradicts one place where, it, no, it's an argument from silence. It's terrible. A failure to hint that Paul wrote letters to the churches. Most of Paul's letters were written within the boundaries of the book of Acts, between chapters 13 and 28. In fact, a lot of them were written while he was right there in Rome in that last uh, chapter or so. The uh, prison epistles, we call them. And if he wrote Hebrews, he would have written it from Rome as well. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. But it's possible it was Paul. The best objection here is the same as above, argument from silence. It, it's not within the scope of Luke's purpose to write about Paul writing letters to the different churches. It's not the purpose. Disharmony alleged concerning Paul's visit to Jerusalem. Paul doesn't mention in Acts 11 Jerusalem, his Jerusalem visit in Galatians. Another argument from silence. Does it mean that he didn't go? No. It means it's not mentioned in Acts. Acts 11 visit was not part of the scope of the Galatians. In Galatians, he is trying to convince his audience that he received his message through divine revelation and not from the other apostles. He made a visit to Jerusalem. In Galatians, uh, there's another visit that he makes where he meets with the apostles and gets the right hand of fellowship. But Paul's message, the message he brought to people, was by divine inspiration. When did he get that? That's a good question. He is in part making the case that he was never in Jerusalem long enough to learn from the apostles. That's what he's teaching and or telling people in Galatians. The alleged difference in Paul's attitude towards the Jews. Paul's letter, especially Galatians, is an attack on Judaizers, while in Acts 21, he enters the temple to complete his own vow and to sponsor others who had vows. What are Judaizers? simple terms they are Jews who Jewish Christians who tried to get Gentiles to follow Jewish tradition Jewish requirements as part of being Christians well in order to be a good Christian you had to be a good Jew also that's what they were to say is that true do we have to be circumcised no, no. Paul even says that But the Judaizers were saying, yes, you do. You need to observe the Sabbath. You need to be circumcised. You need this. You need that. You have to follow all these traditions that the Pharisees had put out. The same thing that Jesus nailed to the cross. And Paul is saying, don't you guys get it yet? It's done. We don't have to do that anymore. It's about mercy. It's about grace. It's about love. It's about compassion. It's no longer about law following. Rules and rules and rules. You know the Ten Commandments? Jesus reiterated nine of them. Do you know which one he didn't reiterate? Keeping the Sabbath.
had a good illustration from uh, one of my professors. Let me see if I can convert it over to Texas illustration. This was Missouri. So Texas at one point was under Mexican law, right? And under Mexican law, murder was illegal, right? And you got punished for it, correct? Well, today, murder is illegal. But when you get punished for it, is it under Mexican law? In the Old Testament, murder was illegal because, well, the law said so. In the New Testament, murder is illegal because Jesus says so. If we are guilty of murder in the New Testament, do we get punished because the Old Testament said so? No, we get punished because the New Testament says so. Our New Testament law, New Testament rules, and there is some liberty to that. It, it's different in that it comes from a different source. Jesus is the law now. Matthew 28, 18, or is it 19? 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus is the law. We are punished because Jesus said so, not because the law said so. But how come the, uh, the apostles are all practicing Jewish traditions and Jewish laws? They were practicing the Sabbath. They were going to the temple on the Sabbath. They were worshiping in the temple. In fact, Paul even circumcised, uh, was it Timothy? But the law has no meaning or no purpose anymore or, or well, purpose is not the right thing Jesus didn't do away with the law he fulfilled it but if the law has no meaning why are they still doing it did we stop doing some things that we were doing before we became Christians once we became Christians if there's nothing how do I want to say this there was nothing wrong with them practicing Jewish traditions because they were Jewish, but it was no longer a part of what they had to do. It was a part of what they desired to do. It was a tradition. They observed the Sabbath because that is what they'd been doing their entire lives. It was a tradition. They still worshiped in the temple area, well, in part because that's where they met people that they could teach and preach and try to convert and try to help and try to bring to Jesus. And Paul explains why Timothy was circumcised. Was it Paul or Luke? It is explained. Timothy was circumcised so that he could he could work with the Jews. It opened up a door for ministry for him into different areas that he otherwise couldn't go. Remember, his father was Gentile, his mother was Jewish. Right? He was kind of raised Gentile, and he meets Paul, no circumcision. Well, we'll fix that. Now you can reach the Jews. Not because he was doing it, because the law said so. But it opened up some avenues of opportunities for him to evangelize, preach, teach. Judaizers were trying to make Christians observe Jewish practices as necessary matters of faith, and Paul was saying, no. And that is the only thing Paul was speaking about against Jews. The charge that Paul's theology does not match. In Acts, it is thought he believed Christ's death was simply a crime the Jews had wrought, while in the epistles he taught that it was a vicarious sacrifice. Really? Is that what he said? The evidence for such a claim or refutation of a claim is incredibly meager. Suffice it to say that Paul's theology in Acts and in his epistles do not contradict. Now for some assurances of trustworthiness. 
boy, I'm going to have enough left over for next week. This is just the introduction. You thought Mike was slow, right? How long has he been on, John? 27 months? I think he started in December, two years, and yeah, 26 months. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It only matters that we learn from it. If that means it takes three years to cover the introductory matters, well, no, I don't want to take three years. Nobody wants that. Um, assurances of trustworthiness of X. Fixed dates. The author connects events and acts with world historical events. He mentions the passage of days. He, more so in the second half of the book, but that's because he was there. You know, on this day we did this. On this day we did this. And then we sailed for this. He, he mentions the passage of days. He mentions people in power, individuals. Um, he mentions them by their accurately by what their title was. Um, what was the guy's name? Paulus. The he called a senator a senator. He called a governor a governor. He he, he called people by who they actually were. He was historically correct. He was geographically correct. Uh, never makes a mistake noting the different moral rules, political conditions, and activities when discussing the different cultures in Asia. He was also incredibly accurate when he was talking about the, the shipwreck that he and Paul were, were in. Now, the, the, everything that he describes were the same things that sailors go through when they're in a storm trying to save their ship. Tossing all the cargo overboard. Things like that. There's, you, you lighten the ship up. As a sailor, that doesn't make sense to me, but I didn't sail on ships with rigging and masts and things like that, actual sails. I sailed on ships that had engines. And so the lower in the water you are, the, the more stable you are, you tend to be. But they wanted to rise above or get above the, the water, so they they dumped the cargo. Apparently that was normal. Dropping the anchor so you could slow yourself down or try to slow yourself down and not be driven by the wind so badly. It's having steerage. Uh, that's the most important part in the storm is, is being able to steer the ship rather than have the storm dictate where you're going to go. But he was accurate about that. Luke's orderly manner of presentation is excellent. He's considered very adept at fitting the speeches of Peter and Paul into the narrative. He'll go through a little section and then he'll insert Peter's speech, Peter's sermon. We have uh, Acts 2, Acts 3, uh, I'm losing some train of thought here. Anyway, it, it, a little narrative, set up the, the situation, and boom, there he is. Little narrative set up the situation and there he is he likes to present people a little earlier before he starts discussing them more thoroughly Barnabas Barnabas doesn't really come into the play until he and Paul start working together right well we got Acts uh, 12 13 something like that and yet Barnabas is introduced at the end of Acts chapter 4. Son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means. Barnabas. Son of encouragement. Son of exhortation is also another thing that it could mean. Um, Barnabas sold a field and gave the money to the church. And then we don't see Barnabas much at all for several chapters until he and Paul get together, right? Right? No? Am I wrong? The point, he introduces Barnabas well before he starts using him or, or applying him to the text on a regular basis. He introduced Paul as Saul. 
in uh, Acts chapter, is it the beginning of chapter 8? Where Saul is there holding or watching over the cloaks of the people who were stoning Stephen. And we don't see him again for, what, another a little while later, and he goes through his conversion process in chapter 9. But in the meantime, here's Acts chapter 8. We've got, what, Philip and, and uh, Philip in Samaria, Philip and the Ethiopian, the, the rest of the story of Philip, and then we lose track of Philip until Paul shows up in Caesarea 25 years later, 20 years later, something like that. But then, you know, Paul is introduced, and then he goes through his conversion process, and he's forgotten about again for a couple of years or a couple of chapters anyway. You see that? He introduces them first before he starts applying them in a, in a more thorough situation. He writes from the general to the particular. First gives generality and then he gives specifics, both good and bad. Acts 4 and 5, he writes that they had all things in common before giving the good example of Barnabas, followed by the bad example of Ananias and Sapphira. Luke is very exact. In the first 12 chapters, he, use, he uses Semitisms, Hebrew idioms of manners expressing um, expression, of manners of expression showing through in Greek language, which we would expect is those chapters were addressed, um, or they were about people in Palestine, the work of the, the gospel in Palestine, right? It isn't until chapter 12 we start getting away from Palestine. Up until this point, everything is Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And even Samaria took until chapter 8 to get to. Acts chapter 1, verse 7, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Right? Over the first four or five years there, they kind of forgot about the rest of that. Jerusalem, 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 Judea. Jerusalem, Judea. Oh, persecution. Let's go to Samaria. Makes you wonder about that persecution. Is persecution a good thing? Blank looks. Is persecution a good thing? Huh? You don't think so? Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, the Beatitudes. Paul writes that if you know, we will be persecuted, where does he write that? First Timothy, maybe Second Timothy. If we are living lives of Christ, we're going to be persecuted. Christians will be persecuted. It's supposed to happen. What's that? I remember the words to a song, contemporary song came out oh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, your, your life's not falling apart, it's falling into place. He's prepping us, and the persecution does that. And it also gets people motivated. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, and that's, they took selective listening to the extreme there. And all of a sudden, there's a great persecution that starts the beginning of Acts chapter 8 at the, at the stoning of Stephen, the martyr, martyr, martyring of Stephen, Persecution takes place and all but the apostles scatter. And what's our next part of the story? Philip and Samaria. Finally, they get to the third part of where they're supposed to be witnessing. Third place, Samaria. Next is the ends of the earth. And we've got to wait another four chapters for that. By the way, that, uh, that verse there is our, our four-part outline of Acts. Well, three part really. We're going to combine Jerusalem and Judea. Candor. Luke does not hold back on the truth. 
he tells of the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. He doesn't hold back. He notes the discontent in Jerusalem among the Hellenistic widows. What's a Hellenistic widow? Good, I love those blank looks. That's, it's a teaching moment. A Hellenistic widow is... Um, now, as the church started, it was almost entirely Jewish and, or Jewish proselytes, and they had become Christians. And what had happened was um, widows had managed to work their way down into Jerusalem, probably came for one of the, the annual festivals, and then they stayed. They heard the message, they became Christians, and now the church was trying to take care of them. They were widows. And what was happening was there were some distributions and it seemed to favor the Jewish rather than the widows from the dispersed Jewish who had come to Jerusalem. Um, if you're still Jewish, but you grew up in Greece, Athens, Rome, or you grew up in Galatia or somewhere else, and so maybe you speak a little bit of, of Aramaic, but it's with an accent because it, it's actually a second language for you. And, uh, and they're treated differently. They're kind of treated poorly. You're not a true Jew. You're a Jew, but not really a true Jew because you weren't born and lived here. And it, it's, there's some definite bias going on. And, and they're complaining, you know, we're being left out. You guys are taking care of the, 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 the Jewish widows or the, the Judean widows without taking care of us the same way. And they complain about that. And Luke records it. Here's a problem in the church, and Luke records it. We don't hide or cover up our downfalls, our, our what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it, when we fail, we show it. We don't sweep it under the carpet, under the rug, hide it. Ooh, Mike on the ball. Maybe he's getting tired of listening to me, too. Come on, smile. This is fun. Um, he doesn't cover it up. He shows for what it is. Oops. How do we fix it? We get seven guys to make sure that these distributions happen the way they're supposed to. And that way we can focus on the things we're supposed to focus on. God's word, prayer. Right? This was... Not something the apostles needed to do. We ever see that before? Where somebody was having ha handling too much for others for himself and had to go get some help? Y'all remember Moses? Two and a half million Jews all coming up to him saying, Moses, wah, 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 Moses, wah, wah, wah. Finally, his father in law says, You gotta stop this man. Go get some people out of each tribe and let them handle the smaller stuff and you handle the big stuff only. It'll drive you crazy. I sounded pretty good complaining, didn't I? I've had a lot of practice. There's honesty and fidelity to the truth and he does not cover up failures, shortcomings of the church or its members. He points it out. Characters are introduced before they become prominent. I already mentioned that. Acts is a book of particulars. Luke carefully details, or provides details, uh, and there are 100, 110 different names used in the book of Acts. 110. It's not a he said, she said. It's a, this is their actual name. You know, I, I, how about Dorcas? Tabitha. Tells why they called her by a nickname. Missed something. Date. Got enough time? Yeah, we got enough time for date. And then we're going to call it quits. The date. Luke's Gospel uh, dated to 60. That's generally what most people have. 60. What happened in 60? What happened to Paul in 60? I appeal to Caesar. 
He's been two years in accessory in prison at the uh, as a guest of uh, Felix and Festus before he finally appeals to Caesar. He's not getting anywhere. He's been sitting in a prison doing nothing. He wants to go somewhere. He's had his chance. He's had an opportunity. Every time he's had an opportunity, they've said, you know, that's a good story, but we're not changing. Felix, Festus, and uh, Herod as well. Which Herod was that? Agrippa? Two? I think it was the second Agrippa. It's time to move on. He appeals to Caesar. Hey, now he gets a free trip to Rome. <coughs> Thought you were going to say something there. No. Paul spent uh, two years in accessory in prison. Conservative scholars generally believe it was during this two year period that Luke would have completed his investigations for the completion of his gospel, volume one. He would also have completed his investigations for much of his second volume, the book of Acts. The first 12 chapters. He wasn't part of those. He wasn't part of those chapters. The information he had up until uh, Paul comes along, he has to go investigate. He'll have to find out. He's in Palestine. He gets to run down to Jerusalem, talk to some people. Uh, was it Paul said there were 500 people still living when he wrote 1 Corinthians 15? Many of them were still living? One year, traveling to Rome. Shipwreck, stuck on Malta for a while. Takes him a year to get to Rome. How long is he in prison in Rome? Two years. Uh, Acts 28. So, three years later, book of Acts. Notice the abrupt ending in Acts 28? And there is an abrupt ending. That real quick, he should be ringing a bell. He hasn't got up yet. I still got a moment. Uh, verse 30. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching concerning the Lord Jesus with all openness and unhindered. unhindered. Two years in Rome. And then the book comes to an end. He's headed for the bell. So, Mass is 63. Questions? Questions?